<clears throat> well, you do like your complicated questions, and I'll give you that. Uh, <laughs> now, let me see. Uh, now, there's a, there's a kind of quick answer, and there's, there's very kind of nuanced answers to this, but the quick one, I think, is that it wasn't to do with Reagan and Francione ousting Singer. It was to do with um, the persons that the groups that made up, especially at the time, you know, 80s, 90s, who made up the animal rights movement. And they were always more keen on endorsing Peter Singer than either Gary Francione or Tom Reagan. In fact, um, I mean, if you look at a new welfare group like uh, Peter, Ingrid Newkirk actually argued against both of them. She argued against Francione and um, Reagan and said she's going to go into bat for the welfareists. And so she's always taken a new welfare position. And so the people who kind of was in charge of the movement structurally were in Singer's camp. And so even if we think that Francione and uh, Reagan housed Singer philosophically, kind of doesn't count really. And then Francione interprets all of that in terms of money. You know, who is saleable? Who is the easiest to sell? Well, it's Singer, who described himself as a flexible vegan. And, you know, it, this, is, this is the start of the kind of Tobias Leonard kind of position, the Melanie Joy kind of wishy-washy uh, position, right? If you've got somebody taking a, a rather more absolutist position, and as we know, you know, Reagan said, you know, if, uh, if an injustice is absolute, you have to oppose it ab absolutely. And so he, he took a hard line in that sense, or... <laughs> the other interpretation of that word is he was consistent, right? Uh, groups groups like Peter and Animal Aid and Viva and all the rest of it, they prefer wobble, a bit of wobble, a bit of a bit of movement. So they can kind of keep the vegetarians on board. They can keep the kind of uh, people who are not so sure on board. They can keep the non-vegans on board and this kind of stuff. If they were to propound animal rights theory... That would be much harder. So what does that mean from the corporation's point of view? And we've got to remember that there's more of them now than ever before. I mean, you know, this movement is made up of businesses, really. Another line from Francione. You know, what does it mean is, is that they're, they're less likely to be able to, to afford their wages, essentially. So that's um, Francione's complaint, that um, the philosophical distinction is kind of coloured by the fact that there are people looking at that and going what you know uh, subscriptions you know and now nowadays um youtube hits or you know clicks and this kind of stuff you know which is the easiest one to sell and as we know animal welfare is easier to sell than animal rights even if, I mean, the people will say, well, I'm an animal rights person. You know, we're an animal rights group and all that. And so that's why they, they fell into the new, uh, the new welfare position of um, claiming to be animal rights, stating their animal rights. Animal Aid, the first animal rights group uh, in Britain, 1977, Jean Pink, blah, blah, blah. Right. Never, never read a page of animal rights theory, I'm sure but all read animal liberation and all sold animal liberation. So that's the problem. I think it's a, the... Uh, wait, <laughs> this, <laughs> you like this? Because this is what's with the, the short answer. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the... Um, so the short answer is it's a business problem. You know, the, the, we've, we've gone from a movement and a cause, as Leslie Cross and Watson would have seen it, to be a kind of business with lots of employed people and stuff. Now, is that good? Is that bad? There's arguments on both sides. 
but certainly it would certainly colour the way that they would look at Singer versus Reagan and Francione. There's no doubt about it.